Thanks, everyone. So for the purposes of my talk, I want you to assume that Leif talked about meta-analysis and that he convinced you that it's broken and unfixable. So just imagine that. You know, it's hard to believe. Okay, so today I'm gonna to talk about getting papers accepted in social personality journals, post-replicability crisis. And just to give you a little bit of background, I'm an editor-in-chief at SPPS. And before that, I was associate editor at a handful of journals. And I'm also a senior editor at a new open access journal called Calabra. So those are, I'm gonna be talking all, mostly about SPPS. And a lot of what I say doesn't necessarily generalize to other journals. And part of my point is that you really have to look specifically at the journal's policies and the people running it and so on. Um, if you wanna know what's gonna predict whether your paper's gonna get accepted or not. I'm also not able to see my next slide, so it's gonna be a surprise uh, to me as well as to you. Okay, so I'm gonna go over this very quickly, but before 2011, I think many of us thought a counterintuitive finding is really cool. Three-way interactions are sophisticated. If it's below 0.05, it's below 0.05. If you have six studies, even if they're all small sample, that's really impressive. Like, it's really hard to get a series of studies all pointing in the same direction. Um, and I think now, you know, we have different attitudes about these things. Maybe not completely opposite attitudes, but at least a little more reserved. So we know some things that predict whether an effect is likely to replicate. So if the p-value is closer to zero, it's probably more likely to replicate. If you have a larger sample, you're probably more likely to replicate the result. If the original study looks at main effects or lower order interactions rather than three-way interactions, more likely to replicate. Pre-registration increases our confidence that it'll replicate. If the paper itself included an internal replication, we should have more confidence that that finding will replicate. These things are not as uncontroversial as I'm making them sound, but I think there's some evidence for each of these things, some stronger than others, and that's something we can discuss too. I also want to point out that we kind of always knew these things, but now we know it more. And it, one of the interesting things about the last five years has been reflecting on why we didn't know these things before, even though people have been saying these things for many, many years. Um, but I think, you know, and contrary to Leif, the fact that I don't have anything new to say does not stop me from accepting these speaker invitations. And this is one of the reasons, right? We knew these things before 2011, but we didn't really. And so I think we think we know them now, but I think we still don't really. So I think it's good to keep repeating them to ourselves and to each other. Okay, so how does this affect journals? Well, how much should journals care about replicability and how much should we balance it with other values? Well, one nice thing about the fact that there are many journals is that different journals can try different approaches. So some journals might decide that they're gonna care a lot about pre-registration, other journals might decide they're gonna care a lot about sample size or about, um, you know, different, there's a lot of different approaches journals can take and I think this is really good, right? It's the same idea as having, letting states have different laws in the US that you can figure out what works, what doesn't, and then the things that seem to be working, we can try to scale up and see if they also work when we generalize to other journals and so on. Okay, so, in choosing what journal you want to submit your work to, here's a little flow chart about how journal policies and decisions get, <coughs> get made. So there's a society or a publisher that owns a journal, and not, some, not all journals are owned by societies. Some journals are owned directly by the publisher. So Elsevier owns some journals, even though they're affiliated with a society. Um, and then that society, if it's owned by a society, has a publication committee or board. That publication committee or board often chooses the editor-in-chief. Sometimes there's, there's some oversight from other people in the society as well. The editor-in-chief often chooses the associate editors, again, sometimes with some oversight from the higher levels. The associate editors choose reviewers and so on. So these are the people who make the decisions along the way. For SPPS, there's four societies that own the journal. The publication committee is a board of representatives from each of those four societies. The editor-in-chief is me. The AEs are 10 people, including two other people in this room, Lauren Campbell and Deepika Blydorn. And then the reviewers are probably many of you. So all of these people influence the ultimate decision that gets made on a paper, although most directly the editors are the ones who make the decision on a paper, but that's influenced to some extent by the policies set higher up. So if you're interested in uh, choosing, when you choose where to submit your paper, you're also choosing which of these societies and so on, you want to reward with your hard-earned data and results. So some policies at SPPS, some of the newer ones that have come into place since, um, since I took over as editor-in-chief six months ago. So one thing, we, uh, there was never a policy against accepting applications, but it's now listed as one of the types of papers that we accept and we're, we're eager to consider them. We now require authors to report effect sizes, 95% confidence intervals, and exact p-values for their key results. So if you have a 10 by 10 correlation matrix, you don't necessarily need to report everything for all of them, although we encourage you to do that. Um, 
but especially for, for your key results, we want to know all this information. Tables and figures now can be embedded. Don't put them at the end of the paper, and reviewers will appreciate this very much, I think. Um, so you can put your tables and figures in the text. That has nothing to do with replicability, but I think it's a nice change. Um, they also don't count towards the 5,000 word limit. I think that is relevant for replicability because it means you can more fully describe your results. There's no excuse not to provide descriptive statistics, provide alternate specifications, etc. You can do that in the tables and figures. They won't count against your word limit. Also, on our end, we're trying to increase transparency. So the handling editor's name, the action editor, uh, will be published with each article. So that, I think, will help with meta science if anyone wants to look at trends and who's accepting articles and so on. Um, upon submission, we ask authors to uh, complete three or four check boxes. So one, that they report how their sample size was determined and discuss the implications for statistical power. Confirm that they report all data exclusions. This should look familiar to you. It's uh, some of the things in the 21-word solution that Leif and his colleagues have proposed. Confirm that you report all measures or conditions of interest to the research question. And confirm that you report p-values, effect sizes, confidence intervals. And we do allow for some flexibility. If you're using a statistical analysis where it's not, we don't really know how to compute effect sizes or something like that, feel free, you can explain that. Okay, so I'm gonna show you some statistics about our decisions since 2015. So we've handled about 300 manuscripts since, 2000, since July 2015, so in the last six months. 38% of them were desk rejected, 50% were rejected after review, 22% have a revise and resubmit decision. Many of these haven't had a final decision on them yet, but we anticipate that most of those will get accepted. So roughly a 17% acceptance rate, which is identical to all previous years of the journal. Basically, SPPS has always had a 17, 18% acceptance rate that hasn't changed. The desk rejection rate has gone up a little bit. I think it was 33% last time they calculated it. Now it's a little higher. Are you forcing your AUs to give 110%? <laughs> it, does it, uh, so 22, oh yeah, one of those numbers is wrong. I don't blame them, I, so hard work is important. <laughs> yeah, okay, it's 40% rejected after review. That's the one I miscalculated from the other two numbers. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. So 40% rejected after review, 22% revised and resubmit. Um, the average number of days to decision is 30 days. If we exclude desk rejection, it's 46 days to the first decision. Impact factor, 2.56. Okay, so here's my, my, the first thing I'm gonna tell you guys about is what proportion of desk rejections have something to do with power or sample size? So I want you guys to vote. A is 25%, B is 50%, C is 75%, D is 100%. Okay, who votes for A, 25%? Who votes for B, 50%, C, 75%, and D, 100%, anybody? Okay, okay, it's 75%. So I'm only including the desk rejections here that I made, so the AEs also desk reject papers sometimes, but the vast majority of the desk rejections come from me. So the, my sample size here is 92. That's how many desk rejections I made of the first 300 or so. Actually, it was a little bit less than 300. Um, so, 70% of them had to do with power, or 75% had to do with power. Another chunk was because it was cross-sectional study with self-reports that were, they were correlating self-reports with other self-reports. It's another common reason for desk rejecting if there's nothing special about it. Another chunk was design issues, and that's not to say that the other ones didn't also have design issues. Um, so these are not mutually exclusive necessarily. And then another section for other. Uh, one thing I wanna point out is that I didn't desk reject any for being unimportant or for being a brick in the wall. That's pretty important to me that I don't really want to make my own subjective assessment of the importance of a paper a reason for desk rejection, um, especially because many of these papers are not in my area of, you know, my most expert area. Um, there were, so I shouldn't say 0% for unimportant. I think there were two that I, I desk rejected because they were like a translation of a scale and I felt like that wasn't important enough. So there, it's not quite 0%, but almost. Um, I also turned the graph so that power was eating everything else that was on purpose. Okay, then I wanna talk about among the ones that were rejected for reasons having to do with power. Again, that wasn't necessarily the only reason, um, but a good chunk of them had what I call a triple whammy, which is having a small sample, having um, p-values close to 0.05, and looking at a higher order interaction. So usually either an interaction, but often a three-way interaction. So when it has all of those things, it's especially likely to be desk rejected. But I do want to point out that, of course, I make exceptions, and I don't hold all designs and all populations to the same standards in terms of sample size. So I have accepted some papers with very small, or 
either accepted or let through to review the review process papers with very small sample sizes when, when it would be very, very hard to collect a large sample and the authors are making circumscribed conclusions, making a case for why we need to accumulate evidence on this topic a little bit at a time because it would be impossible to accumulate evidence a lot at a time. Okay, so a lot of papers had triple whammy. A lot of them had double whammy, which is small samples, um, especially in a design where it would be easy to get large samples and p-values close to 0.05. Um, a lot of them had single whammy. The ones with single whammy were just a small sample, basically. Often they're amateur studies, uh, very easy to run. There's really no good reason to have a small sample. Um, and uh, they might also have other things like design issues and so on. That I, I would have put them in this category if it was, that was the only power consideration. Okay, what comes next? Okay, so some common problems. So because I am asking authors to check off the boxing that they discuss statistical power, I'm, a, I'm getting authors to talk about what the implications of their sample size are. Now, how come so many papers are still getting dust rejected for power, even though people are making a good effort to discuss this? So often power is still ignored. People, just because they check that box doesn't mean they actually talk about power. Another common problem is that people do do a power analysis, but they use an unrealistic effect size in their power analysis. And often um, they, don't, they don't justify that at all. They just say, we had 80% power to detect a D of 0.9. And they don't give any justification for why we should expect a D of 0.9. Or the justifi justification is based on one or a few underpowered studies. Um, so, you know, if, if I go and look up the reference they give for why we should expect a D of 0.9, it's a study with, you know, 50 people um, with really large uh, error bars or, or a large confidence interval. Or it's a justification based on a selective slice of the literature. So I'll often see people cite one or two studies and ignore other studies that had much smaller effect sizes. Or it's a justification based on a meta-analysis that doesn't adequately take into account publication bias and p-hacking. So meta-analyses, the, if they're not adequately correcting for publication bias, aren't really a good basis for power analysis, as Allison talked about. Another common problem is that um, authors report power analyses that use observed or post hoc power. So that means looking at the effect size that they got and then justifying their sample size based on that. And there's a lot of good papers on why that's wrong. We don't want to use it. The fact that you got a significant result can't, can't then be used as evidence that you had adequate power. Another common thing, thank you Leif Nelson, is author citing the Simmons et al. paper to justify 20 people per cell. I'll just forward those on to you in the future. Um, okay, so I have a lot of sympathy um, for authors who probably feel like they can't win. I encourage people to conduct power analyses and now I'm telling people I don't like your power analyses. And I'm starting to think more and more that maybe I was wrong to encourage people to conduct power analyses. I, and there's definitely a caveat there. But I think that really, you know, as and Allison alluded to this, that sometimes it's really, really hard to conduct a power analysis because how can you know what the effect size is that you should use as the basis for your power analysis? And if you did know with a lot of certainty what the effect size was for your phenomenon, then why are we still studying it, right? So we're studying it because we don't know or there's some uncertainty. So then that's hard to do a power analysis. So I think what I would encourage people to consider is not doing a power analysis and instead just use this power analysis that I'm gonna do here. Here's a power analysis for the field of social and personality psychology. The average published effect size according to a 2003 meta-analysis of the whole field was a D of 0.43. So for 80% power, you need 90 per people per condition to have 80% power to detect a D of 0.43. Or if you're doing a correlational study, 180 people total. There's some debate about whether total sample size matters more or sample size per condition. I'm still trying to educate myself about this and I would love to hear your thoughts on this. I think it depends on your question. It depends on whether you want to do any comparisons of specific cells and so on. But I would encourage you to aim for 90 people per condition. Now keep in mind that this recommendation is based on the average published effect size. Average means half of published effect size were smaller than this. Published means definitely inflated. So I think it's actually pretty reasonable to assume that you might very well be setting an effect smaller than 0.43. So I would encourage you to consider if you really, really care about your effect, you really want to avoid a type two error to consider planning for an even smaller effect. This is especially true if you're looking for an interaction, an indirect effect through mediation, or you're doing multiple regression looking for part correlations, that kind of thing. So in those cases, I would definitely assume that your effect is probably smaller. There are cases where interaction effects can be bigger than mean effects, but for the most part, the higher the order of the effect, the lower, the smaller the effect is gonna be. 
Um, if you're looking for a three-way interaction, my recommendation is to pre-register and replicate. It's gonna be hard to convince people of a three-way interaction. Okay, of course, my one power analysis for the entire field doesn't apply to everything, right? If you're not doing a traditional between-person study, uh, you know, you need to do your own power analysis. Um, so if you're doing anything else, if you're doing a mixed with in-between design or in-person study or you have a Poisson regression or you know, anything outside of the very mainstream type of analysis, then do a power analysis but be conservative in your effect size estimate and report all assumptions you're making. So if you have repeated measures, report what assumption you're making about the correlation among the repeated measures. If you want to interpret null effects, then you need a really large sample and power, the traditional power analysis doesn't work but Cumming has some really nice spreadsheets for calculating what sample you need to get a confidence interval small enough to exclude any meaningful effects. So you decide what's a, an effect big enough that it would be inconsistent with the null, then you figure out what sample size you need to exclude that effect, and it's gonna be a large sample size. I will also note that a very, very common uh, thing that I, I saw as I was content coding my decision letters about reasons for death rejection was that people were interpreting null effects with very small samples. Usually it wasn't their key question, but it was ruling out an alternative explanation and often that alternative explanation had a P of 0.18 or something like that. And guess what? With 30 people per cell, a P of 0.18 is consistent with a pretty large effect. So you're not really ruling out that alternative explanation. If you aren't effect concerned about effect size, you can use sequential analysis. And there are other options too. I'm kind of focusing on the, the most simple uh, solutions. And of course, there are other things that affect power besides sample size. I'm focusing a lot on sample size here. So what if you can't get um, a large sample. So I, again, I'm, I understand that there's a lot of research questions where um, it's hard to collect large samples. Maybe you have an unusual population or you have intensive procedure or intensive coding or it's really expensive or you, you're studying the effects of an extraordinary event that you can't recreate in a lab or it's high risk. You know, For all of these reasons and many others that I haven't listed, we might very well consider it worthwhile to publish inconclusive results based on small samples you know, every now and then and wait for a meta-analysis or something, some other way to get to a more conclusive um, conclusion. <coughs> so in that case, consider sequential analysis, consider definitely pay attention to confidence intervals, definitely adjust your conclusions. So just because it would be really, really hard to collect large samples doesn't mean that therefore you get to make the same conclusions from small samples that other people would make from large samples. You still don't get to make those conclusions. You might get to publish less conclusive stuff but you have to adjust your conclusions and definitely don't interpret null results. Um, so if you're studying something really, really hard to collect data on and you're predicting a null result, I don't know what to tell you. Like that's gonna be really, really hard to make a case for. Um, some other things you can do, pre-registration will save your butt. So, you know, so there's been so much said already about pre-registration that I won't say a lot, but I will say that from the perspective of a reader, a truly large effect and a p-hacked study look the same to the observer. So if you, can, you want to convince us that it's the former and not the latter, pre-registration is a really good way to go. But don't, you know, it's too much to ask of readers to trust you without any kind of pre-registration or anything else that, no, 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 it's not p-hacking, it's just, it really is a huge effect. There, are, there, were, there have been a few cases where there was a manipulation that was so obviously powerful on the face of it, or you know, there was a really, really clear reason to expect a very large effect where I accepted that the sample size the small sample size was adequate, but it's but one person's objectively strong manipulation is another person's subtle manipulation. So I think you know I wouldn't rely on being able to convince everybody that you really expected a large effect. If you really expected a large effect, prove it by pre-registering that. Um, so right now I'll believe almost anything if it's pre-registered. I think you know our standards are going to shift. So I might in 2016 say pre-registration gives you a ton of points. I'm like willing to accept a lot of other less desirable features if it's pre-registered, maybe that will change in a year or two. But right now, I'm very impressed when I see pre-registration, and I'll believe a lot of things that are pre-registered that I might not otherwise. And as Rich pointed out, direct replications of many of the benefits of pre-registration. So that's something to keep in mind, too. What about conceptual replication? So this is something I come across a lot, where yeah, it might be that the study has a high p-value and a small sample and is looking at a three-way interaction, but they replicated that three-way interaction conceptually. Now here's why that doesn't help with the problem of false positives and the concerns of low power, because of the possibility of a file drawer, because of undisclosed flexibility in data analysis, because harking is still possible. So there's often, it's not that hard to imagine ways that the second study, the conceptual application might have come out that could still have been interpreted as consistent with the first one. Um, 
So readers can't tell if conceptual application was truly a strong test. Were your hands really tied and you, were, you would have accepted the conclusion whatever way it came out? Direct repl replication eliminates most but not all of these problems. So a pre-registered direct replication is obviously the most compelling and convincing result and that, that's what you know, Rich was suggesting. If your own results have been subjected to replication, other people have failed to replicate them, I think if you really want to provide conclusive evidence for your original result, that's one way to go. Okay, so we can't all do pre-registered direct replications, although as Leif would say, why not? Um, but let's not answer that question and move on. <laughs> so how else could you convince somebody that your study isn't likely to be a false positive? So one is transparency and disclosure. And I think you know, until we get to the place where pre-registration becomes very common, I think this is a really, really good intermediate step. So if you aren't p-hacking, show us by being open and transparent. So the 21 word solution, disclosing all flexibility in data collection and analysis, telling us what's in your file drawer. If it's nothing, tell us that. Tell us what predictions were a priori and what was harked. Make your data materials publicly available if you can. Or, you know, and again, and if you do have things in your file drawer or if it, your hypothesis was harked, tell us that, it's not the end of the world, it's okay. Or if you can't share your data, tell us that, that's okay too. You can't necessarily do all these things, but the more you can do them, the more uh, credible your results will be. There was something else I was gonna say about this, but now I'm blanking. Oh yeah, so if we're gonna give credit for people for doing these things, and I do, I take everything you will say at face value. If they tell me that their sample size was predetermined, I believe that their sample size was predetermined. That means that lying about these things has to be considered fraud. Do not lie about these things. Do not claim that you reported all flexibility in your data analysis if you didn't, okay? That has to be considered fraud, and what you get in return for that is that I will believe you. Even if you didn't pre-register it, if you say it, I will believe you. But that means you're in the realm of making a scientific claim that you're staking your reputation as a scientist, your right to be called a scientist, your right to be in the field on your honesty in those disclosures. Um, so I'll forgive a lot if you show you're being open. So again, it's a matter of how much confidence I can have in your result. If there are none of these signs, and there are signs that you're finding might not be as likely to replicate because it has a high p-value or something like that, then it puts me in a position where it's very difficult to know how much confidence to have in your result. And it's not that I'm assuming that you're p-hacking, it's that I'm assuming that everyone is p-hacking. It's really not personal. I think, you know, I that I found the Garden of Forking Past paper really compelling, and as I started paying more and more attention to what we were doing in our own lab, I realized we just can't get around it. We're always p-hacking, and even when we're aware of it, you know, we can't stop. And for the reasons that we have come up here before that we want to explore, we don't want to miss discovering things in our data. Sometimes we realize that we miscoded something and we should exclude, you know, certain participants and so on, but we might not have made those decisions if the initial analysis had worked out, right? So it's just unavoidable. Even without p-hacking, small samples are fluky. You know, Rich talked about this, about how effects bounce around even without p-hacking. The risk of false positives is high. So if I tell you I'm not sure your result will replicate, um, that you're in good company, it's not personal, it's not a judgment on you, I tell myself the same thing about a lot of my own results. In fact, I, uh, I was talking to one of the AEs about this, that I'm nervous about submitting my own stuff to SVPS now. Like, I don't think much of my stuff would meet the standards of the journal. And I want it to be, you know, I want to have high standards on some dimensions. I also, yeah, we can talk about. So I think actually that's, yeah. Our journal's going to be full of boring obvious studies. I think this is something we need to think about. My first reaction to this question is only if the only things that are true are boring obvious things. And maybe that's the case. I think we have to seriously consider the possibility that a lot of the most exciting things, most counterintuitive things we've been used to reading, maybe we're not gonna read that so many of those things anymore but maybe that's because many of them weren't true. I don't know, but I think we have to consider that possibility. So I don't think we should take, if, if we start seeing more boring, obvious results in our journals, that's not necessarily a sign that we're doing anything wrong. We should consider the possibility that we are, but it might be that that's just what the truth looks like. And the fact that something would be really important if true is not a good reason to publish preliminary evidence when it wouldn't be that hard to collect more conclusive evidence. And again, like, that 75% in that pie chart, so that's 75% of the desk rejections, not 75% of papers submitted to SPPS, but the vast majority of those are studies with mTORC samples or subject pool participants, and it really, there's, they're really simple designs, often they're people run in groups, you know, they spend maybe half an hour in the lab, et cetera, 
many of those studies, it really wouldn't be that hard to collect more conclusive evidence. So I just don't see a reason to publish it without a certain amount of certainty around the effect. When it would be hard, then it makes sense, I think, but the conclusions still have to be calibrated to the strength of the evidence. Okay, so some, to summarize what I've talked about, power is almost necessary. Um, and you often don't need a power analysis, you just need a large sample. Again, I do think there are some cases where we want to make exceptions, but it's really, really important. Pre-registration is very helpful. Direct replication is great, and conceptual replication doesn't address some of the issues that I've raised here. It addresses other issues, but not, if there are other signs that your stuff might not replicate, conceptual replication isn't really gonna address those concerns. Transparency always helps. What gets published in the future might look quite different than in the past, but if your effect is real, you should still be able to get it in. You might have to do more work. In fact, you pretty much do have to do more work, that's what I'm saying, but it should still eventually be able to get in. And I, I wanna talk a little bit more if we have time about what, how this connects to what Eli was talking about with trade-offs. If you're willing to be extra open, you'll have a better chance. And I put an asterisk, I can't remember if I actually wrote this down on the slide, but um, that's only at some journals, I think. You know, not all journals will necessarily give you any credit for transparency. It's something if you're, if you want, if you believe in the values of transparency, I think you should pay attention to which journals you're submitting to and submit your work to journals that reward the practices that you want rewarded. Um, so what can you do to make these practices more common? I don't know if you're asking yourself this, but just in case you are, you can do them. You can submit your papers to journals that have explicitly expressed these values. I put up the two that I'm affiliated with and I'm still a little bit affiliated with JRP. There's a lot of other ones though. I'm just being self-serving here. And as a reviewer, you can use these considerations when evaluating manuscripts. You can make a big difference by raising these points. Okay, that's it. Question, yeah. Trade-offs? Trade-offs, okay. So I, after Eli's talk, during and after Eli's talk, I've been thinking a lot about this question of trade-offs. And one distinction that I think is important is trade-offs within the issue of quality, validity, truthiness, so sometimes there's trade-offs within that, that you do something that might increase one kind of validity, but might decrease another kind of validity. And then there's trade-offs where a practice pretty clearly increases validity, but has side effects outside of the question of validity. For that latter kind of trade-off, I think journal editors and journals are in a special position where we kind of need to ignore the side effects, and it's the job of the field to deal with those side effects. So if there are practices that as a field we've consensually decided our ideal or better practices should be rewarded, should be valued over others. For example, if we read as a field that our larger samples are better, all other things being equal, and then it has this side effect that it slows science down or that it has consequences for how our field is run or how people can get jobs or things like that. To some extent, journal editors have to kind of plug their ears to those side effects and think about validity on its own. If there are no trade-offs within the realm of validity, I think they should reward and, and value those practices. And then, when they take their editor hat off, they can talk about how do we deal with the side effects, or other people in the field can talk about how do we deal with the side effects, and that's really, really important too. But I've been thinking about what is the role of journals in terms of the, how, respo how responsible are we for the side effects of new policies, if those policies, if people agree that those policies improve the quality of research. That's what I've been thinking. I don't have like really good answers, but that's my thought. So, so I, I was curious. So the more specific question then is, uh, I have a lot actually, but, but um, so I'm an editor at, at JPSP. By the way, I can tell you that, that the JPSP editorial team is nowhere near as uh, assertive or explicit as Samin, but all of us are paying attention to these issues. All of us value, every single person values these things, including me for sure. Um, the, um, so the, the point that I made is actually an interest. I don't know where it fits into your dichotomy. So I made the point that true things that would have been published in 2010, many of which either won't be published or will be published several years down the road. So I guess that's actually a big difference. So I think you, you would say is go go back and do more and, and publish and, and then publish it in 2019 or 2021 or whatever it is. But I but I would suggest, and I, I suspect this won't be controversial, that some percentage of those things that are true in the population the people will give up on it or they just won't right. make it into publication. So does, where does that fall in your, type, your right. type dichotomy? So I think if we do these things that I'm suggesting, we will slow down. We'll investigate fewer questions. We'll run fewer studies. Um, and so 
in terms of, okay, so you're saying that there were things pre-2011 that would have been published that are true that are now not gonna get published. I would say, from my point of view, where I think the false positive rate is high enough that pre-2010, I have a hard time knowing which of those things were true or not. So I would rather have fewer things published and have 80% confidence that any given one is true than have more things published, know that many, like maybe 50% of them are true but not know which ones. So I think we're trading having more things out there and knowing that a good chunk of them are true but not which ones, for having fewer things out there but having a, a stronger certainty in each of them. And I prefer that trade-off, but I think, yeah, it, it depends a lot on what, you're, what base rates you're assuming about truth before and after um, and things like that. There's two questions back there. I don't know what order you guys want to go in. Allison? So to build on the trade-off point, when you're talking about validity, I hear you talking in terms of the validity uh, or reproducibility or reproducibility of a particular relation between an operational yeah. manipulation measure or measure and measure. So you're saying, I want to be really confident in those parameters. But those are something you're talking about validity, like do our results mean what we think right. they mean? Yeah. And there I see a trade-off, right? I want to be really confident in the bricks that I'm mm -hmm. using to yeah. build my understanding of whatever problem I'm tackling, but I also want to know that they, yeah. these things mean what I think they mean, right. and their conceptual replication is invaluable. Yeah. And I do see a trade-off, right, that I struggle with, and I was talking about this earlier in response to Kyle's question about the, the more we increase our sample size, we actually don't need, for my favorite effect, which is a lot bigger than what you were talking about there, we don't need 80 people per cell, we need 50 for 80 percent um, power, you can see, because eight out of our 10 studies are significant when we study this effect, right? And, and there we are running bigger samples, but we're running fewer conceptual. Yeah. But you could run the conceptual applications if you just delayed the start of your next project, right? So it, it comes down to slowing, it, and, and it slows it down. You could still do all, this, all the studies you would otherwise have done. It just doesn't take long. In, you would in your lifetime, that. you would investigate for your questions. <laughs> be a lot of but for each them. question you're investigating, you could still do the same ratio, you could still do the same number of conceptual applications, but it would cost you time. But I do want to say something about the, the construct validity or the other kinds of validity besides statistical validity that I really didn't talk about here. And the reason I didn't emphasize it as much is because I was focusing on just rejections. And I don't feel as editor in chief that I'm necessarily the best person to make a judgment about construct validity or operationalizations for topics that I'm not, I don't study myself. So if I do did have a concern about construct validity or something more specific to the phenomenon, I would pass it on to an AE and ask them to make the judgment because it's more in their area. So yeah, I feel like because power is something that's less specific, of course there are some sp differences in typical effect sizes across sub areas, but there, I think the, in general, there's more homogeneity in, in what counts as enough power across different research topics. But for construct validity, it really, you, I think you really need expertise in that research topic, so that's why I talked about that less, but absolutely. And I also think another way in which uh, sometimes statistical validity there's a trade-off with construct validity is putting things online. But a lot of times you lose uh, external validity or, or you have to use worse operationalizations when you put things online. So I don't want to live in a world where we end up just doing these quick and dirty studies. I do think like actual face-to-face uh, -face interactions and things like that, coat behavior, et cetera, is really important. So I, I do see these trade-offs for sure. Yeah, yeah behind Allison. Um, I just have a question about how you're determining Determining uh, these, these, it sounds a bit face valid, but it's not really yeah, okay. geared towards uh, what we actually use. I'm sorry this issue came up earlier. It wasn't no, it didn't. Really talks, but I'm going to give two quick, two quick examples, one of which doesn't actually apply to me, but one has to do with the enter data mm -hmm. collection. Right? So I know that there are studies out there which suggest that there is the, the effective sample, the effective pool of participants to enter is much smaller than we actually realize. Mm -hmm. And there's learning that occurs over time. So if you want to be rigorous about how you collect data, you might be excluding people who have gone through similar manipulations in the past, drastically reducing the number of people who mm -hmm. can actually do the work. The second is thinking about sample sizes with participant pools across schools. Mm -hmm. right, so I don't have this issue now, but yeah. one of the schools I was at earlier, uh, they would do the standard process of divvying up the undergrad population, the mm -hmm. undergrad one-on-one -on -one pool, and assigning a certain number of hours. And one of the, uh, one semester, the number of hours given to each uh, researcher was nine. 
How do we get so, ready for okay. So for the MTurg, I'm talking about studies on MTurg. Like I'm talking about the difference between running 20 people per cell and 100 people per cell on MTurg, which I don't think we're bumping up anywhere near that limit that you're talking about. But if I was asking people to run 3,000 people on MTurg, maybe that would be a concern. But I don't, yeah, I think I'm not. Unless I'm it's not a very different. mature literature. Yeah, maybe. Then for the subject pool issue, I do not take into account how hard it would be for this particular author to collect the data, and I don't think it would be ethical for me to take that into account as a journal editor. So when I mean that it's hard to collect data, I don't mean it was hard for this research team to collect the data, I mean it would be hard for scientists to collect these data. Um, I think this is one of these issues that I think journal editors have to be blind to, and the rest of the field has to take really, really seriously. How are we gonna deal with the fact that not everybody has access to resources and subject pools and so on at, at the same levels, but I don't think a journal editor should be taking that into account. Yeah. Yes? I have a really good question. So I was thinking more about funding, and so like, if you don't have any grant funding or funding from your university, 100 people per cell versus 20 people per cell on MTR costs you a lot of your personal money. So does that fall into the category of just saying uh, as a journal editor, I would never take that into account. But, yeah. but I, I could take my journal editor hat off, and yeah. I mean, so I think that's a, that's an issue for the field. I, I I don't know. I mean, I would take that more broadly than MTurk, just in general. What do we do about the fact that some people have more funding than others, and that not everybody can collect large samples? I mean, I would say some of the suggestions that Allison made, like consider within subjects design, consider collaborating with people at other schools. Is there something special about your population that you could exploit to do something that other people couldn't do? I think there may be ways, but I think you might have to ask different questions than you would if you had more resources. Yeah, it just seems like it's going to make it harder for people to publish. Yeah. Oh, of course, these things are going to make it harder for people to publish. I think if it makes it, yeah, absolutely, many of the changes we're talking about are going to make it harder for people to publish. And those effects might are going to affect different people differently, and I think the field has to take that very seriously. Uh, in the back, one of you guys had your hand up for a while. I'm not I sure. just have a really practical question. I love the idea of disclosing carving and file drawer, especially I would definitely put it in the manuscript because um, I read all cover letters, but I'm not sure every editor does or reads them carefully. Um, and I, yeah, um, so I would definitely put it in the manuscript. I also think that way. So only the editor receive, sees the cover letter; the reviewers don't. So if you want reviewers to see something, definitely put it in the manuscript. The other thing I would say is if you're pre-registering. Um, I would put that, make it really salient, because if you just put it in one sentence somewhere, it's easy for people to miss. I would consider putting it in the abstract, describing it as a pre-registered study. Um, okay. And same thing if you have direct replication in your paper, like really make it easy for reviewers to see those things. Yeah? See, you kind of saying that as an editor, you kind of plug your ears to the issues that the field at large has to deal with. And when we're thinking about change, a lot of people say that the editors An editor definitely needs to be responsive to what the field thinks is a good policy. And so I think I'm talking about a case where, which may not exist, but in my mind there's some things that come close to this, where the field has agreed that certain practices are ideal and are good and should be rewarded in terms of being good for quality of the study, quality of the conclusions, and not just statistical validity, but all kinds of validity. If the field has decided that a certain practice is better than another practice on that dimension, then I think it's good policy. I would encourage journals to start implementing those policies as other branches of our field, not the journals, but other committees, et cetera, try to deal with the side effects of those policies. But I do think if the field decides the side effects make it that policy not worth it, journals should be responsive to that, and editors should be responsive to that. But I think we have to be able to separate the quality issue from side effects that are outside of quality. Not to say that there aren't side effects that also impact quality too, but sometimes the side effects are outside of that. And, and I'm, like I said, I've just been thinking more about this since Eli's talk, so I, I want to think more about it before I really commit to any position on it. I'm kind of floating this idea. Um, yeah. yeah. So in order for people to mention instances where resources are going to be used to be the ability to get higher quality evidence on certain questions than other 
people, how do you feel about drawing weaker conclusions where you have weaker evidence rather than just trying to draw them? Absolutely. I, I mean, so what I was talking about with cases where you're studying like a, a phenomenon that would be really, really hard to get a large enough sample to draw a strong conclusion. So, you know, studies with really special populations or really intensive procedures that are really expensive. I think it's worth publishing the evidence in smaller increments that are less conclusive and calibrating your conclusions. Absolutely. Whether we should be doing that at the investigator level and saying you you can't get a large sample, so therefore you can publish with a smaller sample, just calibrate your conclusions. I don't think that's fair. I mean, there might be another medium for that, but I don't think journals are that medium. I, I believe in the value of trying to separate who the investigator is from evaluating the evidence itself. And I think with that, we're out of time, but I'll stick around if anyone wants to chat more. Yeah, thank you very much. That was nice. continue with the discussion. It was great to have you here. Thank you very much. Take care.